Titanic, a British luxury passenger liner, held the distinction of being the largest ship afloat when it commenced service. Built on an unprecedented scale, it boasted the capacity to accommodate 3,547 people in both speed and comfort. Her reciprocating engines were the largest that had ever been built, standing at an impressive 40 feet in height with cylinders measuring 9 feet in diameter. This monumental engineering feat required the burning of a staggering 600 long tons of coal each day. On April 14, 1912, under the command of Captain Edward John Smith, the largest ocean liner of its time carrying an estimated 2,224 people, tragically collided with an iceberg during her maiden voyage from Southampton, England, to New York City in United States. The sinking, which occurred two hours and 40 minutes later at 2.20 ship's time, 5.18 Greenwich Mean Time, on Monday, April 15, resulted in the devastating loss of over 1,500 lives. Among the passengers were some of the world's wealthiest individuals and hundreds of emigrants from the British Isles, Scandinavia, and other parts of Europe, all seeking new opportunities in the United States. Titanic had advanced safety features, such as watertight compartments and remotely activated watertight doors, contributing to its reputation as unsinkable. On the 14th of April, the Titanic received six cautionary messages from other ships, alerting the crew to the presence of drifting ice. Despite these warnings, the ship was traveling at a speed of approximately 41 kilometers per hour. Not all of these messages were relayed by the radio operators. The ice conditions in the North Atlantic were worst, which was the reason why the lookouts were unaware that they were about to approach a vast expanse of drifting ice several miles wide and extending over many miles. The initial warning was issued by RMS Coronia at 9 o'clock, reporting the presence of bergs, growler, and field ice. Captain Smith acknowledged the receipt of this message. Subsequently, at 1342, RMS Baltic relayed a report from the Greek ship Athenia, indicating encounters with icebergs and large quantities of field ice. Captain Smith acknowledged this report and shared it with J. Bruce Ismay, the chairman of the White Star Line. In response, Smith ordered a change of course to navigate the ship farther south. At 1345, the German ship SS America, situated nearby to the south, reported having passed two large icebergs. Regrettably, this crucial message did not reach Captain Smith or the other officers on the Titanic's bridge. The cause of this communication lapse remains unclear. Later in the evening, at 1930, SS Californian reported the sighting of three large bergs, followed by another report at 2140 from the steamer Masaba, describing encountering much heavy pack ice and a great number of large icebergs. Astonishingly, the latter message failed to reach the Titanic's radio room possibly because the radio operator Jack Phillips was preoccupied with transmitting passenger messages through the relay station. Complicating matters further, the ship's radio set had experienced a breakdown the day before, resulting in a backlog of messages. At 11.30 p.m., a final cautionary message arrived from Californian's operator, Cyril Evans, stationed in an ice field some miles away. However, the communication was abruptly cut off by Titanic's operator, Jack Phillips, who signaled back, shut up. I'm working Cape Race. The wireless operator on the Californian turns off his radio and goes to bed. Despite the crew's awareness of nearby ice, they maintained the ship's speed at 41 km per hour North Atlantic liners prioritized punctuality, strictly adhering to schedules that prioritized arrival times. Hazard warnings were often treated as advisories rather than immediate calls to action. The prevailing belief at the time was that ice presented minimal risk, with past incidents such as the 1907 ramming of the German liner SS Kronprinz Wilhelm into an iceberg resulting in a damaged bow but a completed voyage. Titanic's future captain, Edward Smith, even declared in 1907 that he couldn't imagine any condition which would cause a ship to founder. As Titanic approached her fatal collision, most passengers had gone to bed. Lookouts Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee were in the crow's nest, 29 meters above the deck, in conditions that seemed deceptively calm with near-freezing temperatures. The lack of moonlight, combined with the tranquil sea, concealed the nearby icebergs. At 11.39 p.m., Fleet spotted an iceberg in Titanic's path. He rang the lookout bell three times and telephoned the bridge to inform 6th Officer James Moody. Fleet asked, Is there anyone there? Moody replied, Yes, what do you see? Fleet replied, Iceberg, right ahead. Moody passed the message to Murdoch who ordered to change the ship's course. Murdoch told Captain Smith that he was attempting to port around the iceberg. There was a delay before order went into effect. The steam-powered steering mechanism took up to 30 seconds to turn the ship's tiller and the complex task of setting the engines into reverse would also have taken some time to accomplish. 
Had Murdoch turned the ship while maintaining the speed, Titanic might have missed the iceberg. Although Titanic managed to change its heading just in time to avoid a head-on collision, the change in direction resulted in a glancing blow. The starboard side of the Titanic scrapes along the iceberg. Approximately five minutes after the collision, all of Titanic's engines were halted, leaving the bow facing north. Captain Smith arrives on deck and is told that the ship has struck an iceberg. Designer Thomas Andrew surveys the damage. The Titanic was built to remain afloat with only four compartments flooded. Andrews informed the captain that the first five compartments were flooded, and therefore Titanic was doomed. Andrews accurately predicted that she could remain afloat for no longer than roughly two hours. At 12.05 a.m., on April 15, Captain Smith orders to send out a distress signal and the ship's lifeboats to be prepared. However, many passengers and crew hesitated to comply, either refusing to believe the severity of the situation or opting to stay inside the warm ship rather than face the cold night air. Although the passengers were not officially told that the ship was sinking, some passengers noticed the ship sinking. Around 12.15 a.m., stewards began instructing passengers to put on their life belts, but many treated the order as a joke. About 40 minutes after the collision, the loading of lifeboats was underway. The interpretation of the women and children evacuation order varied between the officers launching lifeboats, as one officer understood it as prioritizing women and children first, while the other officer believed it meant exclusively women and children. Unfortunately, neither officer knew the maximum capacity of the lifeboats, which could have safely accommodated 68 people each. Had this been done 500 more people could have been saved. Consequently, lifeboats were launched every few minutes with many vacant seats, leaving hundreds, mostly men, on board. Meanwhile, other crew members worked tirelessly to maintain essential services as water was pouring in the lower decks. Engineers and firemen vented steam from the boilers to prevent explosions upon contact with cold water. They kept electrical generators running to maintain lights and power throughout the ship until the final moments and died ultimately perishing in the ship's sinking. Passengers on the deck became aware of the seriousness of the situation by 1.20 a.m. as they began saying goodbyes. Despite distress flares being fired every few minutes and radio operators seeking assistance from nearby ships, including the RMS Carpathia, which was approximately 93 kilometers away, the rescue efforts faced challenges as even at her maximum speed it would take four hours to reach the sinking Titanic. The SS Californian was much closer, which had earlier warned the Titanic of icebergs, had halted for the night at 10 p.m. Due to Californian's Captain Stanley Lord's concerns about navigating through large field of drift ice. Tragically, at 11.30 p.m., 10 minutes before Titanic hit the iceberg, SS Californian's radio operator, Cyril Evans, unaware of the unfolding catastrophe, had shut down the radio equipment before going to bed just minutes before the Titanic struck the iceberg. A little over an hour later, an officer in SS Californian saw saw five white rockets exploding above the Titanic. Uncertain of what it meant, he contacted Captain Lord, who was resting and reported the sighting. Despite the report, Captain Lord took no immediate action. Three additional rockets were seen at 1.50 a.m., and Californian officer noticed an unusual appearance of the ship in the water. At about 2 a.m. as the Titanic's bow continues to sink, the stern's propellers were clearly visible raising high into the sky. Captain Smith released the crew, announcing, it's every man for himself. Smith was last spotted on the bridge, and his body was never recovered. The last lifeboat departed at 2.05 a.m., carrying 25 individuals. Around 2.18 a.m., the Titanic's lights flickered and went out, before casting the ship into darkness. SS Californian ship's captain, Stanley Lord received notification that the ship was no longer visible. Lord yet again inquired about the color of the lights, learning that they were all white. The Titanic then broke in two, with the bow descending underwater. The stern briefly settled back in the water before rising again, ultimately becoming vertical. After a momentary pause, the stern initiated its final descent, and at 2.20 a.m., the ship sank submerging beneath the Atlantic Ocean. Hundreds of passengers went into the icy water surrounded by debris from the ship. Most of the passengers were left to die in the icy sea, as concerned about potential swamping. Those in the lifeboats delayed returning to rescue survivors. When they eventually returned, most individuals in the water had succumbed to the icy conditions. The water temperature, at minus 2 degrees Celsius, proved lethally cold. An officer vividly described it as a thousand knives piercing his body upon entering the sea. The sounds of fear, despair, agony, and anger from those in the water were shocking to the occupants of the lifeboats. The cries for help, unexpected and inconceivable, continued until a final, haunting silence enveloped the scene. 
recognizing the danger of their boats potentially being swamped by the multitude of swimmers, they slowly paddled away, disregarding the pleas of numerous individuals in the water to be taken on board. After approximately 20 minutes, the desperate cries began to diminish as swimmers succumbed to unconsciousness and death. Throughout an entire hour, there had been a distressing symphony of screams, gradually fading away. Following this, for some survivors, the dead silence that followed was even worse than the cries for help. The survivors of the Titanic were rescued around 4 a.m. on April 15 by the RMS Carpathia, captained by Arthur Rostron, which navigated through the night dodging numerous icebergs at high risk. The passengers on the Carpathia were met with a surreal landscape at sunrise, with fields of ice with 20 large icebergs measuring up to 200 feet high, appearing like points on the horizon creating an otherworldly frozen panorama. SS Californian radio operator, Cyril Evans was awakened at around 5.30 a.m. and asked to communicate about the rocket scene during the night. He finally got news that Titanic had sunk overnight. Captain Lord was notified of this catastrophe and they set out to provide assistance. SS Californian arrived well after Carpathia's ship had already picked up all the survivors of the Titanic. RMS Carpathia took three days to reach New York after leaving the scene of Titanic's disaster as the journey was slowed by pack ice, fog and rough seas. As public knowledge grew of the Titanic disaster, around 40,000 people were waiting for Carpathia to arrive. By approximately 9 a.m., the Carpathia, carrying 705 Titanic survivors, reached its destination New York City, amidst massive crowds on April 18. The ship's arrival in New York led to an insane press interest with newspapers competing to provide exclusive reports of the survivor stories. Carpathia ship's crew members were given a bonus of a month's wages as a reward for their actions, and some of Titanic's passengers joined to give them an additional bonus. One of the controversial issues examined by the inquiries was the role played by SS Californian ship, which had been only a few miles from Titanic but had not picked up Titanic's distress calls or responded to the signal rockets. The inquiries found that the ship seen by Californian was in fact Titanic and had Captain Lord acted promptly. SS Californian could have come to rescue the sinking Titanic. Many had questions on why Titanic's Captain Smith sailed at high speed, in spite of receiving warnings of icebergs. A number of expeditions were mounted to find Titanic which remained submerged in the Atlantic, resting more than 12,000 feet below the surface. But it wasn't until September 1, 1985, a Franco-American expedition led by Robert Ballard and Jean-Louis Michel succeeded. The team discovered that Titanic had in fact split apart before sinking to the seabed. Upon striking the seabed at significant speed, both sections underwent substantial damage, resulting in the bow crumpling and the stern collapsing entirely. Remarkably, the bow remains more intact, retaining surprising elements of its interiors. In contrast, the stern is extensively damaged, with its decks compressed and much of the hull plating torn off, scattered across the sea floor. Encompassing the two sections is a debris field covering approximately 5 by 3 miles. This field contains hundreds of thousands of items, including ship fragments, furniture, dinnerware, and personal belongings. April 14, 2012, marked the 100th anniversary of the ship sinking in the cold Atlantic. After more than 100 years, the Titanic, once the largest and most luxurious ship globally, after its disaster underwent countless renditions, interpretations, and analyses cementing its status as a cultural icon.